Hello, this is Matthew Robert Payne. This is Confessions of a Taxi Driver, part two. And this is the next chapter called Meeting Pilots. I read one time a hierarchy of how people perceive people uh, in society and up the top of the list, it had judges and pilots down the bottom of the list of occupations that had prostitute. Um, and so people really respect pilots. And I've got a friend who helps me edit my books and his name is Dundee. And uh, he's uh, an airline uh, captain uh, in an American airline company. And uh, he's a good friend and makes me really uh, feel happy that I've got a pilot that's a friend because pilots are special people. And uh, I remember driving for three years, uh, picking up uh, passengers um, in Brisbane airport. Whenever I, I got a, a fare to the airport, I used to go and wait in line and wait for a fare back from the airport. And it was important to get long fares to the airport and long fares back. And um, I remember one time I was at the taxi rank and two pilots jumped in my taxi and I didn't normally see pilots. I think they uh, caught buses or limousines but uh, hardly ever caught taxis. And these were the first two pilots I've ever had. And uh, we pulled off from the taxi rank and we were driving into the city. And I asked one of the pilots, how many times have you had a smooth landing? And he said, three times. And I said, how long have you been flying? And he said, 20 years. And I said, it's really that hard. And he says, yeah, he says, um, when you land an airplane, it's like a controlled crash. And, uh, and so it's really hard to uh, land them really smoothly. And uh, I thought that was very interesting. And we had a good discussion about life and uh, what uh, he did. He was a uh, domestic uh, uh, pilot, so he flew in Australia domestically, but he had flown international in his past. And uh, pilots always travel with a co-pilot, and uh, the co-pilot is uh, the lesser trained pilot than a captain but uh, they're still responsible in the aeroplane and assist the captain to fly the plane. So I had a really good uh, discussion with them and uh, was really thrilled to have uh, those people in uniform in my car. Um, yeah, so um, that was a, a memorable time uh, in my taxi, uh, having them as passengers. Um, I remember a year or so later having a female pilot uh, get into the taxi and uh, I told her the story of uh, the pilot that I asked how many smooth landings has he done and he said he'd done three in 20 years and I asked her how many had she done and she said one. I said how long have you been flying? She said 10 years. So she was doing better than the other guy statistically uh, but it seems that pilots uh, tend to not to worry about doing smooth landings because they don't really do many. And so um, those smooth landings, uh, I think most times I've landed in a plane that's been fairly good, but um, uh, I, um, I, 
I've, I've found that the landing of the airplanes have been fairly good, but, uh, but um, Uh, just as uh, I was doing this video and talking about pilots, Dundee, my pilot, just uh, wrote to me um, on Facebook. So it's interesting. It's a confirmation that this book is really meant to be going. So um, in a taxi cab, uh, you find uh, all sorts of people. You find barristers, business people, uh, entrepreneurs, strippers, prostitutes. Um, you often wouldn't know that you're transporting a prostitute uh, from a client's house to your to her house. Uh, you wouldn't know unless you asked her and she was honest to you. Um, but uh, you take barmaids home, you take uh, drunks home, you take housewives home, you take uh, businessmen home. Um, most of your airport job is taking business people to the airport. Um, I know sometimes you drive a five-seater taxi with a big boot and uh, a big uh, cargo part of the taxi, we call it boot in Australia. Um, uh, but uh, uh, when you do that, you may come across a family with uh, many bags uh, for the airport, but mostly you're taking businessmen and women uh, from the airport. So, uh, the next chapter, meeting high-class escort. One time I was uh, taking uh, a pretty woman uh, from the airport and I was asking her uh, uh, what sort of business she had uh, for the weekend and she said she was a high-class escort and she was up. Uh, for the weekend with a client from Melbourne. And I said, how much is it costing him? And this was, this was in 19, it was 30 years ago anyway. It was 30 years ago. And she said he was paying $25,000 for the weekend. And uh, that included Friday dinner Friday night with him, Saturday day, Saturday dinner, uh, Saturday night, Sunday, Sunday afternoon, and she flew out Sunday night. Um, and it was going to cost him $25,000 then. Uh, she had two university degrees and she was uh, a stunning woman. And uh, I'd uh, been addicted to prostitutes, like I've said, uh, for all my life and I've never been in that price range where you pay uh, $2,000 an hour for a prostitute. But I will say I do know uh, Mary Magdalene uh, very well through uh, talking to Jesus and talking to her uh, through uh, my abilities. And uh, I know that Mary Magdalene of the Bible was a high-class escort before uh, Jesus met her. And uh, she used to escort businessmen for seven-day parties and stuff. And she was like a status symbol uh, to have her on your arm. A businessman used to compete and, uh, and that think it was a, a, a manner of status to have Mary on their arm uh, and to book Mary uh, for the weekend. So Mary Magdalene was a high class escort and she was one of Jesus' closest friends. So Jesus has got a real heart for prostitutes and uh, 
they really, um, I have to confess, through my life of addiction uh, to prostitutes, I have to confess that they're really easy to talk to. They're, they're really easygoing uh, people and uh, they've got a wide range of subject matter that they can talk on. They're not boring. And um, you may not have met a prostitute uh, being a Christian, uh, being a Christian reader, uh, if you're reading my books um, and you come across this book um, and you're a regular reader of mine, you may have never actually met a prostitute. Girls don't sit on the train or on the bus and you ask them what they do. They don't readily say prostitute uh, because it's got such a stigma about it. Uh, but uh, all of us have met a prostitute and conversed with a prostitute. We just don't know that we're talking to one at the time that we're talking to it. But this high-class escort in my taxi that day uh, told me she was a high-class escort. And I'd been on the internet sites where uh, girls charge $2,000 an hour and $5,000 an hour, and I knew they existed. I just hadn't met one before and never had the money. So I had half an hour of time. I got $1,000 worth of her time and she paid me for the, for the experience. And uh, I didn't have a mobile phone at the time. Uh, 30 years ago, we didn't have mobile phones. So there's no way she could have uh, contacted me for the trip back to the airport. But uh, I was, uh, it was like meeting the pilot and that's why it's in this book because it was one of my favourite fares. It's one of my favourite uh, taxi journeys, uh, meeting a high-class escort. One time, at one time, I had a car and I wanted to apply to an escort agency to be a driver for the escorts. Um, I considered um, I could give up my addiction to prostitutes if I could just mix with them, if I could just see them socially, I wouldn't have to have sex. It was just uh, a deep longing in me for the company of a female. And currently uh, I've got carers that I see three days a week and uh, they're young females. And uh, so uh, I've been able to uh, quit my addiction. Yeah, so, uh, so the next uh, chapter is meeting businessmen who is doing settlement. So one time I was driving my taxi during the day and I met this businessman and I asked him what he was doing that day and he said he was going to uh, speak to two families to the sons in two families and try and arrange a settlement because they were um, having a legal battle. And I asked them, asked the solicitor what it was about. And he said, uh, there was two families, the father and mother started two companies and uh, the companies merged um, and uh, it was a partnership between these two families and uh, now the father and mothers have uh, left a company to their sons and one, one family had one son and one family had two sons and um, now the family with one son uh, is being taken to court by the family with two sons saying that they should be paid twice as much because there's only one of him and there's two of us. And, uh, and it was going to go to court and uh, they were going to have a legal battle over it. And he was going out to try and counsel them and come to some sort of settlement so it didn't have to go to court. And any time spent outside of court is, is beneficial for everyone. Uh, 
that's why so many court cases are settled out of court because uh, court room time is expensive. So I said, oh, that one's easy. And uh, and he said, what, what do you say it's easy for? And I said, well, why don't you say to the two sons that um, the business was built with you two sons and one son, but um, now there's two sons and one son why don't you take the earnings of today, today's profits and split it 50-50? And from today onward, any increase in profit goes two thirds, one third. But the profits of today go 50% because your father's built this business up. So it was 50-50 business up until recently but uh, any increase in the profit level from this point on goes to two thirds, one third. He said, you're a genius. How did you work that out? And I said, well, that's what's fair. And I think the two sons will go for it, but definitely uh, don't uh, inflict the two thirds, one third on the son who he can't help it that he didn't have another brother. And the guy said, exactly. And said, so, so start with that and negotiate backwards from that. Um, and the guy was asking me questions like, what do you do? Is this all you do? Drive a taxi? How could you have this information? You should be doing my job. And uh, I was just pleased that I felt like Solomon. Solomon was a really wise king who used to settle disputes uh, with his followers and acted as a judge and Solomon's out of the Bible. And I felt really wise in that uh, time, God had uh, given me a solution uh, for the businessman. And uh, I never had a mobile phone, so I never contacted him again, but I always remember how excited he was uh, to take that proposition to the families. Uh, in the dispute and um, as a taxi driver you catch people in all different moods and different frames of mind and it's up to you to entertain them between where you pick them up and drop them off some people want to just sit in the back and be on their mobile phone or read their paper but back then they didn't have mobile phones. Um, and so uh, it could be a boring trip to the airport or uh, on a 20 mile trip. So many people like to engage the taxi driver and talk. And you never knew where a conversation was going to go or what was going to be discussed. And uh, So in preparing for this book, I wrote down chapter titles with some of my stories and some of the things uh, that I encountered. And uh, this businessman was very happy. This uh, lawyer was very happy uh, that uh, I was used in this manner uh, to give him a starting point for his negotiation. Uh, next uh, chapter is meeting senior partner, lawyer. I was uh, driving at night one time, it was about 10 o'clock at night and I picked up uh, this passenger and found out that he was a senior partner in a law firm. And I asked him how he was going and he got emotional. And uh, I asked him what was wrong. And he said um, that they're almost gonna uh, be sent to the liquidators because they didn't have enough cash flow in their business, in their law firm. And uh, he, he was beside himself with worry. And I said, I, 
he said one of the reasons why the cash flow is uh, not very good is because the lawyers haven't been taking progress payments off their clients. Uh, clients have been racking up bills but not paying uh, progressively for their bill, but uh, waiting to the end. And you know how companies uh, wait, have you wait for months to pay for a bill. Um, if the lawyers weren't taking progress payments, the law firm could go under. And uh, I said, I know how to solve that. And uh, coming off the back of the last story, you may be saying, who does this guy think he is? But believe me, these stories happened uh, in the course of three years. So it wasn't every client that I had great advice for. So I said, uh, I know how to solve that. And uh, he said, how? And I said, you know, uh, those uh, companies that do time and motion studies, he said, yeah. I said, you need to write a memo to staff and hire a time and motion study uh, law firm and tell your people in your memo to staff that these firm are coming to uh, do a study in the business and uh, everyone has got to do the recommendations that they do because your job is on the line. Uh, everyone is, uh, job is going to be on the line. Uh, we're, we're in trouble and we need help with our firm and we're bringing this firm in to uh, find out our faults and our concerns and what we need to change. So when they suggest changes, they're not suggestions. It can be your job on the line. And uh, he said, yeah, I said, and then you let them get charged out at $5,000 an hour or whatever they charge your firm. But when the recommendations come down, one of the recommendations is that you must accept progress payments. You must um, get progress payments off your clients and that'll never happen again. And uh, he, we'd stopped the car and he started crying. It, it, it was like a relief had come off his back and he finally saw a solution. He said, how did you come up with that? And I said, uh, I've got a cousin who's involved in time and motion study. And I just knew a bit about that subject. And, and I said, I'd imagine that you're really friendly and all the partners and all the lawyers love you and respect you, but they don't, they love you and admire you, but you're too soft on them and you can't be hard on them. So you need these time and motion people to be hard on them. And uh, he said, uh, that's the solution to our problem. And uh, he, he wanted to hug me and he wanted to tip me a uh, hundred dollars. And uh, I said, you need the money for your firm. And uh, he was so happy. And it's one of the most memorable uh, taxi fares that I had uh, because I really uh, helped this guy and saved his firm. Uh, he was currently working for one of the most prestigious firms in Brisbane. And uh, I'm happy to say that they still are in business today. And uh, I'd like to think I had a small part to play in that. And I was just a humble taxi driver uh, who had the right answer at the right time for a desperate senior partner. And those lawyers they work 90 and 100 hours a week uh, to become a senior partner and uh, a senior partner is someone who's not only a lawyer and in management but he actually owns a part of the firm and he's on profit shares so 
if the firm went under, he'd financially go under himself. And so it was really important to him and it was his livelihood that was at stake. And he'd have a house and he'd have a family, he'd have commitments and everything was on the line for this guy. And I was able to help him, which is, um, which is really handy. And you can go from dropping him off to two hours later having someone vomit in your cab, uh, being so drunk that they vomit. Um, you never know who your next customer is going to be. Um, and you just keep on going out uh, with your hard light on uh, and uh, searching for new customers for your taxi, lining up outside the nightclubs, waiting for all the drunks to come out and catch your taxi home. Um, one, so this is called meeting man whose wife cheated on him. One day I got a, a fare uh, way south of Brisbane. It took me on freeways way south. And I, I just had come up onto a freeway and was going to uh, drive uh, 30 miles to the city. Uh, vacant without a fare and I had to go all the way back to the city to get my next fare uh, but I just had a good trip all the way south and um, as I was driving down the freeway I seen a guy walking along the freeway uh, with, with a bag over his shoulder and I pulled over and stopped and asked him uh, does he want to ride? He says he hasn't got a wallet, he can't pay. And I said, ah, oh, I'm going in the city. You can have a free ride in the city if you like. I said, yeah. Yeah, he said, yeah, okay. And he jumped in the taxi and I said, what are you doing at 2 a.m. in the morning walking along a freeway into the city for... And he says, oh, it's a long story. And he says, oh, we've got 30 minutes. Try me out. And he says, I've been friends with a guy for 25 years. And um, me and my wife were sleeping over at his place. And uh, I uh, got up to go to the toilet and came down to the kitchen to uh, get a drink. And my wife was having sex with my friend on on the on the couch, and so I left. And uh, I said, "Can I um, can I talk to you about this?" And he said, "Yeah." I said, "Don't lose your friend over this." He said, "Why would you say that?" I said, "Don't lose your wife and don't lose your friend over this." And he said, what are you talking about? Uh, having sex in, uh, in the living room. And I said, yeah, when we're married, we, we become complacent in our marriage. We, we overlook things and we don't listen anymore. And you'll find that if you've been friends with that friend for 25 years and how long you've been married, he said 20 years. I said, your wife has known that man for 20 years. And over time, they've become close. And uh, them talking all the time, their, their bond has grown so strong that they've fallen in love with each other. It's not her fault. It's not his fault. It's just that you're such good friends with them. So try not to lose your friend over this. And certainly call his wife in to a conversation, but sit down and have a conversation and say, what are we going to do? Are we going to just leave this as a one-time thing or are we going to move on or what are we going to do? But have a good conversation about it. But it was a good decision to leave and not cause a scene. And... Um, 
we had a really good talk about other things on the way to the city and I was able to give him some money uh, for him to um, uh, get to where he was going. Um, I'd always remember a sad look and uh, in life uh, we can all uh, give advice from where we've come from and uh, I'd been through a divorce and uh, I understood what it was like to be divorced and lose someone you love. And uh, I was able to comfort him in his time of need. And uh, I think I gave pretty good advice. So, um, I think I was the right man for the right job. And I'm not sure any other taxi would have pulled over and picked him up. And uh, I don't know how long he'd been walking on the freeway, but I saw him on my entrance to the freeway. I hadn't been on the freeway for five minutes, so I'm not sure how far he'd come from. But uh, I was able to help him in his time of need. And um, that's the good thing about being a taxi driver is you can catch people in a time of need. When people become inebriated and drunk, uh, they open up and uh, many people uh, know that uh, girls open up to the hairdressers and talk to the hairdressers and the hairdressers become friends. Well, taxi drivers are like a hairdresser, although people get more raw and open up more to a taxi driver because the taxi driver is a stranger and uh, they tend to dump all their problems on a taxi driver, whereas a hairdresser they've got to see again so they can't dump all their problems on them. Um, so taxi drivers are sort of counsellors and um, you found in the last three stories about uh, the man, the business, the lawyer doing the settlement, the lawyer losing his company, and uh, this uh, man with his wife that's cheated on him. You find that these stories all have an element of counselling and wisdom in them. And uh, God can uh, grace you with an amount of wisdom and uh, you can be wise like Solomon, you can have wisdom that you can pull out of your tool belt uh, when it's needed. And as a taxi driver, I was able to pull on that uh, wisdom uh, from time to time. Uh, the next title is Meeting Girls Asking Jesus Questions. I was driving my taxi one time and I was talking to these girls and I got a prophecy for one of the girls. I got a message off one of the girls from Jesus and I told her and she responded really well to it. And I told the girls that I'm really close to Jesus and you can ask any question of Jesus to me and I can ask Jesus and give you the answers. And they are fascinated with that. And it was the right approach to these girls. So they just asked, started asking questions of Jesus and went on for about 20 minutes. Jesus answered about uh, two or three questions each for each of the girls. And... Um, it was a really exciting uh, way to witness of uh, being used in prophetic evangelism a lot, uh, which is using the gift of prophecy, the ability to give like a psychic reading uh, to people, but the source not being a familiar spirit or not being a spirit guide, the source of the prophecy is Jesus. And uh, so many times... I give uh, personal prophecies to people that are strangers on the street. But from time to time, 
after I've given them a personal message of Jesus, I'll ask them if they've got any questions for Jesus. And uh, many times when I'm led to ask that, a person will have questions. Uh, a couple of times um, people have asked how their relatives are doing in heaven. Do I know anything about their relatives? Are their relatives in heaven? Uh, what are they doing in heaven? Have they got a message for me? And uh, every time I've asked that question and they've asked that question, their relative has been in heaven and Jesus has allowed them to give a message uh, to their friends, uh, to their relative. So I uh, don't uh, approach people and say that uh, I'll give them a message from their relative in heaven. I don't. I just ask the person, have they got any questions? And that comes up. So I'm not acting as a medium. I'm not conjuring anything. I'm not calling down the spirit guide. I'm not acting as a medium. So if you read this book and you have an issue with that, it's all totally led by the Holy Spirit. The same as when I said I contacted Mary Magdalene I've been in contact with Mary Magdalene. Jesus actually introduced me to Mary Magdalene and uh, she came down in visions with Jesus and then Jesus stopped coming down with her and she started coming down by herself. Um, so I've seen Mary Magdalene in visions and many people might call this necromancy, but you reminded, I'll remind you of the fact that Jesus met uh, Elijah and Moses at um, at the Mount of Transfiguration and they were dead and uh, Jesus met with them and so it's quite possible to meet a departed saint and it's quite possible to get a message off a departed saint. Um, every time you hear from Jesus, every time Jesus speaks to you, you're talking to a departed saint. Um, and uh, so that just clears that up for, for you. But these girls in my taxi were asking questions of Jesus and Jesus was answering them uh, and answering them very well. And whenever I open uh, the floor up for Jesus, people tend to they, they tend to ask a simple question to start with to test the waters. They dip their foot in the water and then they get a good answer and then they go deeper. So many people ask one or two simple questions of Jesus until they get resounding answers, answers that resonate with them. Then they might ask about the dead relative when they know that you're truly speaking from Jesus. And um, so I like to do that. And that was uh, one of my favorite passengers. There was two, two girls uh, asking questions of Jesus and uh, I really enjoyed that. Uh, next uh, chapter is meeting string of clients that I witnessed to. So years ago, uh, I didn't understand uh, what the glory of God was. Um, I understand now when the glory of God is on me, things become uh, synchronistic and uh, coincidences happen. And uh, I can understand when the glory of God is present with me because people react differently but uh, years ago 30 years ago I didn't understand what the glory of God is and many people who are Christians don't understand what the glory of God is right now so um, but I certainly didn't understand but uh, looking back the glory of God was on me this day I had a string of customers in the taxi and every person that I had in a taxi for six people in a row, 
uh, every person we had a really deep and meaningful uh, conversation about Jesus and it was a really impactful conversation and uh, I'd drop one passenger off and pick another passenger up and straight away we're talking about Jesus again and uh, I, I wished every day was like this I'd just like to talk about Jesus every day and uh, it was amazing and I just kept on with that run and there's a young guy, about 15, I picked him up, asked him where he's going, and I said, so why would Jesus have you get in a taxi today? And I was getting a bit cocky. And, and he says, ah, oh, my grandmother's been praying for me. And I said, why? And she wants me to give up Dungeons and Dragons. And I said, you should give up that game. It's no good for you. And I said, you should invite Jesus into your heart. And, and, and he said, my grandmother's been saying that too. And I said, well, there's no time like today. And he says, yeah, I should do it. I said, well, let's do it. I'll pray. You pray this after me. And I prayed for him. He, he brought the Lord into his heart and I saw a change in him. And I said, when you get out of the taxi, ring your grandmother and say that you just invited Jesus into your heart and what should you do now? And um, he said, will she understand? And I said, yeah, she's been praying for you to do this for years. It's just that I came along and said it's the right time for it. So that passenger I led to the Lord and it was really easy because I was having this day well, I was just in the glory and everything was happening synchronicity wise uh, with uh, what I was doing. That was uh, one of my favorite taxi passengers once again. So you get uh, people in all sorts of uh, situations and moods and uh, taxis. Uh, can be a very vulnerable place, a very a place of outreach. And when you're sensitive, uh, like I have been to the Holy Spirit, you can move and speak and have an impact on customers. So I witnessed to many uh, people in my taxi and I shared many messages with uh, people in my taxi and um, Jesus spoke through me many times um, with people who were passengers in my taxi. So uh, the next title is Saving Girl from Suicide. So I was pulling up to uh, one of the favourite uh, night, night clubs in Brisbane and I waited on a line of about 20 taxis all lined up one after the other and the first one being outside the club and all the rest lining up behind them waiting their turn as hundreds of people come out of this club at this time in the morning. and. Um, but I was right up the end of the line and these two, two girls came and jumped in my taxi and you're allowed, while ever you're on a rank, you're allowed to accept taxi passengers. So I drove off with them and I said, we skipped all the other taxis to get in your taxi, aren't you lucky? And I said, yeah, I'm lucky. And the two girls were talking all the way home uh, until we got to one of the uh, girls' houses, and uh, she got out and said goodbye to a friend, and a friend was in the back seat. And as I pulled out of the driveway, I said, everything you said to your friend on the way home there was a pack of lies. She said, what? said everything you said to your friend there on the way home was a lie. 
You've got no intention of seeing her tomorrow. You've got no intention of bringing her and going to her place tomorrow. You're on your way home and you've got pills at home and you're going to take the pills to kill yourself. That's what you want to do tonight. And she broke down and crying. She said, how do you know this? And I said, Jesus told me. So what's got you so sad? Why do you want to kill yourself? I've wanted to kill myself before. What's got you so sad? And I found out her boyfriend had broken up with her and didn't even want to be a friend of hers. And she was crushed. She was about 18 and it's that early puppy love sort of stage. And uh, she was crushed. She couldn't, what hurt her more than breaking up with a boyfriend was he didn't want to be friends with her. And uh, I know when I lost my wife uh, to divorce, what hurt me more than anything was losing her as a friend. And uh, so I turned the meter off outside the house and we spoke for half an hour after I'd arrived at a place until she was in the condition where she could promise me that she wasn't going to go in and take the pills. But if I hadn't have been there that night, she would have killed herself or she would have attempted suicide. Many people who attempt to suicide by pills don't succeed. Um, and uh, But she would have attempted suicide. So just like that preacher was there telling me that prophecy about what I'd done that night, uh, I caused an intervention in her life just like the preacher did for me. Um, so that was a memorable taxi driving fair. Uh, that was one where I stopped outside her place and turned the meter off for half an hour. The businessman, the senior partner also in the law firm i turned the meter off uh, outside his place and was continuing talking to him and he's the one who offered me a hundred dollars tip and uh, i wouldn't take it but he forced me to take it um but uh uh we all don't know that there's a battle uh, in this life for human souls. Satan wants to take people's lives before they come into a realisation of Jesus. And uh, he even wants to take Christian lives. And uh, uh, I was used in this instance to save her life. And that was a good thing. And it certainly became one of... Um, one of my most memorable uh, taxi driving fares. Um, this is a story of my taxi driving uh, called Outrunning Police. I remember uh, sometimes I'd uh, speed in the taxi uh, and I put my taxi from side to side going around corners and push the people from one side of the seats to the next, to the next, to the next. Uh, and there were these curves in a certain part of Brisbane uh, going up this road where you could do these S bends and uh, push people from side to side. And I was doing that with some passengers uh, on the way to the city once and a police car came the upper way and I looked in my review mirror and it touched its brakes to turn around and uh, I told the people um, I'm going to turn off the meter here and uh, I took the first right hand turn and then took off doing rights and lefts really fast and uh, as a taxi driver who knew the streets I wasn't going to be caught in a cul-de-sac Many people who try and outrun police end up in the cul-de-sac and they get trapped. Um, but I didn't get trapped and I outran the police. The, the, the passengers thought it was hilarious that I was outrunning a police car. 
but um, I was an experienced driver with 60 hours a week driving and um, police don't drive 60 hours a week and um, I was a professional driver so I outrun the police and that's another adventure and another one of my confessions as a taxi driver. Um, when you spend hours on the road, um, it uh, adds up. It uh, adds up to uh, constantly uh, getting booked. Um, when I drove for James, uh, James hadn't had a, a fine for for five years. He was a really responsible driver, but I was a driver that uh, took things, pushed things to the limit. And uh, I was constantly getting booked for different offences. And uh, it actually cost me my licence um, at one stage. But uh, outrunning the police was uh, certainly had my blood rushing, um, but it was funny at the time, and uh, and my passengers really appreciated it. Um, at one time, I was uh, so the next chapter is driving luxury cab. So one time I uh, came across an owner who owned a luxury cab, like it's a taxi that's like a limousine and uh, you used to have to dress up in a dress shirt and a tie uh, to drive it. And it was part of a network of taxis where you had to pay $10 extra to book the taxi. Um, and um, over my time of driving the taxi on the day shift, um, I was able to build up a stock of clients. So when I picked up a, ta a, 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 a customer in Kenmore, or I picked up uh, someone that went to the airport, I was able to give them a business card. And by that time we had uh, mobile phones and they could ring my mobile phone and book a fare to the airport once a week. Uh, so we worked out of a diary and uh, we could uh, schedule in fares to pick up. And the extra $10 uh, saved us 20 minutes before, or 30 minutes before the job. We were driving to be in place and um, the extra 10 minutes allowed us to be there 15 minutes before the job was needed. So the people could come out early and get in a taxi and drive. So I really enjoyed that. I, I uh, enjoyed dealing with uh, long fares to the airport and back all day and uh, uh, being treated with business people all day. And, uh, and certainly the money I made extra was really fun. Um, the luxury cab was uh, used with players and, uh, and I worked for Carl and um, he, he uh, used the luxury cab at night to take uh, customers home. Um, I take strippers home, and uh, sometimes when I drove at night, I, I used another taxi besides the luxury cab, and I took strippers home at night. So Carl had a business uh, with a strip joint, transporting strippers everywhere, and he used his luxury cab for that. The, the strippers travelled in style like a limousine. So, um, point number 17 uh, is losing points 
losing license. So I had an owner who, who lived a uh, 20 minute drive from Kenmore, which is, was um, a long way out of the city. And uh, I was finishing work. And so I had to drop the taxi off to him and then he had to drop me home. And I was living in the city in Spring Hill. And uh, so I had to drive about 40 kilometers, about 35 miles to his place to drop the 40 miles to drop the taxi off and then get a lift back um, to the city. And it was late into my shift and I was really tired and I had to drive fast to keep myself awake. And uh, when I got to his house, he wasn't there and I rang him and he said he was at another house about 60 miles from there. And um, I had to drive, then I had to drive 60 miles and uh, I was so tired. It was like a country road, uh, wasn't a built up area. And I was speeding, I was going about 180 kilometers an hour 130 miles an hour um, all the way back in this area that wasn't built up and uh, I came to a corner where I was slowing down to take this uh, uh, right hand corner and uh, I was slowing right down but I was still doing 160 kilometers an hour when this police car came the other way and put its uh, radar on me and um, he turned around and followed me and chased me down and uh, I pulled over as soon as I knew that he'd, he'd found me. I couldn't outrun him all the way to the city. So I pulled over and he said, I clocked you doing 160 kilometres an hour. I said I was doing a lot more before I started slowing down for the corner and he said, this is going to be six points. This is going to be a 300 and such and such dollar fine. And I said, that means I've lost my license. I've lost my taxi license. And uh, I threw in my keys to the taxi. I said, you can take the car home. I'm just going to catch a taxi myself. And I said, I've given up. And he said, you, you got to drive the taxi back. And I said, no, you can. You've taken my license now. I'm not going to drive. And um, he said, you can drive until you get the fine in the mail. And I was just broken. And he said to me, I was sitting on the curb crying. And he said to me, perhaps this isn't the right job for you. Perhaps... Perhaps you should be looking into doing something else with your life, Matthew. And here I am. I'm doing something else with my life. I'm writing books and so far I've written 75 books. And uh, my taxi driving license came to an end uh, one day when a girl charged me for a sex-based offence actually touched her on a stocking on her leg and told her she had a ladder in her stocking. And she told the police that I ran her, my hand up a dress and uh, I got charged with that, which wasn't true. And uh, it uh, put me as a sex offender and uh, I can't get a taxi license. So always remember those poignant words of that um, policeman while I was sitting on the curb crying and he said perhaps this isn't the right job for you Matthew so I hope uh, you've learned something uh, in uh, my recounting of my story um, I enjoyed my taxi driving career I really enjoyed it uh, I can't drive taxis anymore. Um, 
I hope uh, it gave you insight into the life of a taxi driver. I hope that you enjoyed some of my stories and uh, hope some of you uh, think of possibly having a career as a taxi driver. Um, but uh, it was a privilege to share that part of my life with you and I enjoyed sharing my stories. Um, please uh, check out all my other books. God bless.